How are you all today? Uh, my name's Scott. I've been an infill developer uh, and real estate broker residential for about 20 years now. Um, so when I first started, lots down in Bolden cost 85 grand, and now they're 585 uh, for comparison. Uh, I started building before the McMansion ordinance was in effect, and, and now here we are today with an affordability problem and a, a transportation problem and everything else in between because the city has grown so much. And that's putting a lot of pressure on a lot of things, and that's what Code Next is designed to, to try and alleviate. Uh, so uh, I've been volunteering for Evolve Austin, uh, which is a broad coalition of all the business groups you, you, many of you are probably members of, RECA, uh, ABOR, um, the HBA, um, the Chamber, the Downtown Austin Alliance, and then 32 other nonprofits that really run the gamut. And that's really why uh, what's going on is unusual and why I'm so supportive of it. Uh, anybody who's involved in affordable housing, Habitat for Humanity, Austin Housing Coalition, um, Bike Austin, Transportation, uh, Tech, uh, re really across the board, there's really a broad-based concern that, hey, our, our city's really starting to, to move away from the Imagine Austin plan. And the Imagine Austin plan, you might have heard that thrown around here and there, but the Imagine Austin plan was adopted by the city as the, as the, the, the goal and the roadmap to how to get from today to where we want to go. And th th those kind of comprehensive plans are required by state law, and Imagine Austin is ours, and it focuses primarily on a, a compact and connected city and the benefits that we all get from, from living in a compact and connected city. Uh, so, so that's the lens with which Evolve Austin looks at the code and says, okay, how can, how can we get there? Uh, and Code Next is just one of the, the many ways to get there, but it's an important one. It's one that relates to all of us in terms of our, our businesses. So that's what I'll focus on today is, is really just give you a brief overview of how the process is working so far and then touch on the residential side of the code, which is what I'm, I'm good at apparently, and, uh, uh, and then turn it over to Ron, who's much more of an expert on the commercial side uh, so between the two of us, you should get a, a pretty good overview, and I'm going to leave a little time for questions, and Ron will as well, uh, because I, I, what, I, what we're trying to do today is take something that is inherently very complicated and try and make it a little overly simplified. So I'm sure we're going to miss something, and, and if not, you're welcome to reach out to us for answers uh, afterwards. So um, please keep that in mind. So uh, the process started, uh, oh, s several years ago, but only recently with the release of, of the version one of Code Next, uh, it really came to sort of the public forefront. Um, version 2 is the version we're on right now, and version 3 is what's coming next. Um, so everything I'm talking about today and that Ron's talking about today is in version 2, so we're going to talk about some of the problems with version 2 and then, uh, and then where we hope to go in version 3. Uh, so version 1 was sort of roundly sort of panned as being inadequate uh, for a variety of reasons. Some of it was hard to understand, the city didn't do a good job of rolling it out, frankly, and, uh, and there were a lot of inconsistencies and so on. Uh, so version two came out, and our initial take on it was that it was two steps forward, two steps back. But, but in fact, when we really started to look at it, and uh, Ron and I both were on the AIA uh, charrette, the, where we got groups together, the, the architects got groups together to analyze specific tracks you know, under the old code and then compare it to the new code to see what the differences were. And, and that, that we did the same thing on version one and on version two. And I was in the R3C zoning group most recently, which is residential scale zoning, three units. Uh, and and what, what they found was that, that effectively it's a down zoning. So for a variety of reasons, some non-zoning and some specifically zoning code related, it, re it has reduced unit yield. So, so unit two was a step in the wrong direction uh, in, in many ways. And, and so we are expecting and really pushing very hard for version three to, to swing the other way because it's going to have to in order for us to generate the units that the city needs uh, at prices that, that, that they have to be at, you, you're, you're going to need to generate more units just across the board. Um, so for the, the residential zonings, you've got the, the code and, and then you've got the map and then you have the model. And, and the reason this, this structure is important is they all are tied together. So the code says, okay, using these zonings, you can generate, uh, you know, X number of units per acre based on the zoning you've got, kind of what we're all familiar with, right? Well, you know, you could have the most perfect zoning in the world, but if it's not on the map, it's not going to change anything. So, so the map is tied to the, to the code. So version one, they had a map that was very hard to explain and, and almost haphazard, and it's, it was completely unpredictable. And, and that's part of the problem that they had, is people couldn't understand how the zonings worked or how they went on the, on the ground. Version two, it got a little better, but, but not very much better. Uh, so the maps were still hard to understand, but one important change they made in version two was to include corridors. Uh, Imagine Austin plan identified corridors for growth, and, and those corridors are included 
on the map in version 2, and that's, that was a positive change. It's one of the two big positive changes that came out of version 2. So there's a lot more area that's going to get a lot more of attention in terms of zoning in order to encourage transit and everything else that comes along with units that are built in the right place. Uh, but those units aren't just sort of spread around the city, they're, they're really directed where they should be. Uh, and that's something that I think everybody kind of agrees on. Both sides tend to agree on, hey, we need some, some, some density in the corridors. So. We got more corridors. That's why you see, if you'll see uh, unit counts thrown out, oh, version 1 generated this many units and version 2 is going to generate that many. The, the, the lion's share of those new units in version 2 comes from the fact that they dramatically expanded the map in terms of what was going to get rezoned. Um, the other big change, which Ron will touch on here in a minute, is that commercial zonings went from uh, only commercial to mixed use. So every commercial zone in version 2 now can have a residential component, uh, which is not the case under the current zoning, and that adds a huge chunk of, of potential units. Uh, I think the most recent model that came out this week was about 53,000 more units out of VMU alone. Um, those aren't all the units we need, but, it, but it's a good chunk, and more importantly, it's a real big change, and a change in the right direction. It allows people to live near where they work, and, and allows commercial and residential to interact a little better, and that's, that's better for everybody. Um, so the residential zonings um, are, are still in there, and they were renamed in version two, R1, R2, R3, and R4. And you might have heard these here and there thrown out. The number corresponds to the unit count that is the max under that zoning. So R1 is one unit per, per lot. R2 is, is what we have today is SF3, two units per lot. And then R3 is a, is a house or a duplex, plus an ADU in the back, accessory dwelling in the back for a total of three. It's very much similar in form to what we have today under McMansion. So, you, you know, it's not a, a different type of housing. It's just the same. You can just add an ADU to anything you want behind the, the house or duplex up front. Uh, and then R4 uh, is designed to accommodate more, more types of housing, missing middle housing, as we call it. Missing middle, uh, you'll, you'll hear that a lot, is anything in between single family, one house on one lot, and, and the vertical corridors that I just mentioned, VMU, you know, the high density stuff you see driving down Congress or Lamar. So uh, the, the thing that is missing from our current zone, uh, current zoning process, and, and certainly the zonings, is, is missing middle. You, you know, nobody does fourplexes anymore because you've got to get a site plan for one thing, and that's twenty to $50,000. So nobody's going to go through an upzoning and a site planning process to build a fourplex. You know, you're just going to stick with the two units you can do without upzoning, and you resubdivide and, and stick with your SF3 and move on. So because those, there, there are so many built-in obstacles to building anything but single-family homes or duplexes or really high-density stuff, our, dense, our patterns look like this. It's an L, and, and that's wrong. And that also triggers compatibility because you've got a single-family home right up against some real tall zoning. So what we are, are big proponents of at Evolve Austin is, is a stair step. There needs to be a step down there that allows for some missing middle zoning and takes some of the pressure off of the, the corridor to generate those units and, and also take some of that compatibility limit off the corridor because compatibility limits the height uh, of, of adjacent properties when, they're, when you have an incongruity. So you have a single family home next to a big tall office building, those two do not go together well and, and for obvious reasons, so, so there's a code that tamps that down. The reason that's important is because uh, our corridors that I mentioned are shallow lots, 125 to 200 feet deep is the average. So once you get to that level, the, the compatibility setback, this sort of stair step, essentially covers most of the, the corridor land that, that we would like to build VMU on and really increase our, our transportation options and everything else along with it. So there's a lot of limitations in the current code. Uh, in terms of the, the residential scale zonings, uh, and I, I gave you this handout to, to not to really review today, but just to show you how complicated things got. So it's supposed to get better, it's supposed to get less complicated, and we're, we're supposed to make it easier in Code Next to build units. Um, but, but as you can see from some of this, that's not the case. So R3C allows three units. Uh, you've got a duplex or a house up front plus an ADU in the back. But they've layered on some complexity here that we, you really can't tell if you read the zoning code, but the AIA charrette we modeled out, and, and a lot of things that, that are, are, are not good start to happen in terms of generating units. First and foremost, um, there's a lot of parking restrictions that kick in. Uh, you, you, you know, your, your garage can't be more than the, a third of your front facade, which is uh, the, the net result of all these parking restrictions, you gotta park behind the house now. Uh, so if you build a duplex, and then you build an ADU, you got three units you gotta park, but, but the parking won't let you park in the front yards anymore as one of your required spaces, so you've got to move that required space either inside the structure or around the back. Um, so on a 50-foot lot, which is typical in, in the city of Austin, uh, 50 by 125 is about the average size urban lot, um, you end up with uh, you know, parking that's forced around the rear and all the impervious cover that goes with that. 
Uh, more importantly, you can't build new construction more than 80 feet away from the front lot line. And I really want to reiterate that. That is a major shift in the way in which we build houses. Uh, you might have heard of the McMansion tent. You've got to build a house right now and inside a, an imaginary tent. But that tent extends all the way down your lot. You can build wherever you need to to get around trees and so on. But, uh, but under the version 2 of the code, you can't do that. You are stuck at 80 feet with two stories. And after that, it has to drop down to one story. And that is what we started calling a privacy gradient. The only reason for that is to protect the privacy of the other homes that are in the backyard because it really does cost units. So the, the, uh, the problem with that in and of itself is that it doesn't matter how deep your lot is. You know, your lot could be 200 feet deep, but you can only build two stories in the first 80 feet. And then you compound that by applying the same rule, not just to the typical city lot here, but also to the R4 zoning, so fourplexes and so on. But then they even, they even skipped it up into the multifamily zoning. So the same 80-foot setback applies to RM1B, which is one of the lower density multifamily zonings. So you can imagine taking a nice acre that's somewhere in the middle of town. There's still a few of those left here and there, and we'd all like to find one. And, and I've done a few of those myself. And, uh, but, but under the code, that acre is probably going to be zoned RM1B. And if it is, you can't build eight, two stories past 80 feet, even on a multifamily zoning. So, so part of the effort that, that Evolve has been put, putting into really analyzing the code is, is to really break these things down so we understand what happens. And we keep finding over and over again this added complexity and, and really increased regulatory burden uh, that just makes it harder to build houses, not easier. So even though technically you can build three units under R3C and that sounds like a, an upzoning, once you apply all the, the parameters, it's really not so much, you know. Uh, and, and then when you take those same parameters and apply them to zonings that are supposed to build missing middle housing, that's when things get worse. And so that's what we've been doing a lot of. Uh, uh, I've left some position papers here up front that you guys are welcome to take with you on things like accessory dwelling units. What are, what are good policies on accessory dwelling units? Um, what are some of the feedback we are providing on administrative changes to the code? Uh, and, uh, and also the affordability section. Obviously, there's an affordability crisis in terms of housing here, and how do we meet that? Uh, and and the, the code tries to encourage density bonuses and things like that, but it hasn't been very effective. So we really want that to be, to be effective. You know, really, there's no reason why our code isn't the model that, that other cities can use in terms of affordable housing. So that's a, a, a brief overview, and I apologize if I was going kind of quickly there. That's a brief overview of where we're at. Um, if y'all have specific questions about, uh, you know, zonings or code next or the process, about the only other thing that I think I didn't throw out there is timeline. Everybody wants to know what's happened and when. So version three of the code was supposed to come out December, uh, end, of, end of November, early December. Yesterday, the city released a, a, a memo that said, no, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're going to push it back. And that's to February 12th. So version three will come out February 12th. Um, planning Commission has to take up whatever the, the most recent version is, run it through their public feedback process, and make a recommendation to Council. So that would happen end of February, early March, and then Council has to take a vote on it, and the goal for that that was set very early on in the process is April 18th. And, uh, and that's a goal that we are very dedicated to hit for a variety of reasons. One is the, pro the process has gone on for an exceedingly long time already. Uh, so I think everybody, including staff, is ready for it to be, to be over with. Um, we feel like we've had a chance to really analyze the zonings and make strong recommendations as to how to improve it. So again, we expect version 3 to really significantly improve in terms of these core metrics and goals that, that Imagine Austin has. Um, all right, so uh, other than that, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to give them a shot. Accessory dwelling unit. That's a great. That's a great question. So, accessory dwelling unit is a garage apartment. Uh, it's a detached. Uh, it's a detached dwelling. It can share utilities or it can have separate utilities. Uh, it can only be up to 1,100 square feet under the current code, and that that same size limitation has passed on. And that's something we feel really strong strongly about. 1,100 square feet is enough to get a family in there. You can get a two-two. That's a good functional plan. A lot. A lot of us grew up in smaller houses, and and in fact, uh, in many cases, you know, large families grew up in little three ones that are all these starter homes all over the middle of town. So, so we need to make sure there's that kind of housing available, and and that is something that I think is good about the code is it does keep the ADUs where where they need to be, which is all over Central Austin. It's a good question. You said 1,100 square feet for an ADU. Correct. Correct. Well, Correct. That's the maximum. There, are there can be if you if two additional stacks. 
you, you get two stories, uh, unless, again, un unless you have new construction in front. If you have new construction in front, your ADU has to be one story, and it can't go over the garage. And, and again, we, we pointed out that that's almost a non-starter. But uh, uh, regardless, the ADU size is limited by the size of the lot. So it's 15% of the lot area. The FAR is 15% uh, and, and up to a maximum of 1,100 square feet. And, and of that, you can have 550 on a second floor. Um, so, so about half on the second floor, half on the first. Um, so you can build them over a garage, but you can't make an 1,100 square foot second story. No, I understood that, but the garage itself is 25 to 25. It, so it can be, yes. Area, and then you have the builder floor number one and floor two, I guess. So the garage, the, you can't do a three story because that's another down zoning. All the all the urban all the urban zonings currently are three stories. They they went down to two. Uh, which again is a loss. I mean, height is the one thing we have to avoid adding impervious cover, right? You want to go up instead of out. Yep. So, so there was a, a, a shrinking in the buildable area on all these R-type lots. Uh, so, so again, the, a lot of these things we're really complaining pretty loudly about. Um, that's a good question. And the, and the garages don't count towards that total, by the way. So it's only HVAC square feet. And if you all have ever dealt with the McMansion ordinance in the past directly, garages and carports are a big issue. Uh, there's been a whole lot of publicity about, like, you know, is putting a door in my carport non-compliant, and, and, you know, how does that work? So they, they did do one thing right, and that is take that out of consideration. So garages are no longer counted towards your total FAR. All right. Question here. Yes. So the ADUs, if you have an existing structure, you mentioned a constraints relative to new construction. Yes. But if you have an existing structure and you're adding an ADU, you can still go you can go to two stories. That's right. In fact, in fact, the 80 foot the 80 foot setback is called a preservation incentive because you, if you have an existing home that goes beyond that, or you want to add on to an existing home and go beyond that, it does not trigger the restriction. And so you can keep that you can keep that in there. And the, the and the ADU doesn't trigger it either. Right. And and so the reason they did that is not necessarily as a preservation incentive. It's to keep houses from existing homes from being non-conforming because the new codes were more restrictive. If you didn't include something like that as an exemption, you'd have thousands of homes all over Austin that go beyond that in some way, shape, or form, and it would trigger an avalanche of Board of Adjustment hearings and everything else. Uh, it's still a concern in the code, by the way, but, but, but it's not as bad. Exactly. It's, it's really a concern is to make sure we're not you know, making a whole lot of existing housing nonconforming while we're, we're changing the zoning around. It's a good question. Yes, I, I wanted to know, how, how expensive would it be to go underground? Like, to add like a level underground versus to have it and still in my mind I'm getting a two story concept here but currently if you do what what the city defines as a true basement you, you know which I'm going to call underground uh, uh, then that does not count towards your FAR limit um, and similarly the attics don't uh, you have an attic exemption that don't count towards your FAR that they don't even call a third story even though that's what it is when you go up to the third floor to your attic uh, so there are ways that you can can work around that, but we rarely see underground uh, just because of the cost and topography quite often. Okay. Yes. So <coughs> with all the ambiguity, you know, version one, version two, has you know kind of see a slowdown in development, or developers just kind of like, hey, let's just jam this through before you know, it's better to operate with what we know uh -huh. versus what. It, it, it hasn't, the schedule hasn't been well defined enough yet. In fact, I would say that schedule happened yesterday, that, that the February schedule is probably going to be a pretty hard schedule. But up until yesterday, it was still kind of up in the air. So nobody had really jumped in. But I will say this, when the first version f came out, uh, we all were sitting around looking at it. We went to the AIA charrette. We all concluded that it would create a run on, on permitting and, and site planning and so on, not, not because um, the new code was so, was so much better, right, which is kind of the intent, right, uh, but because the old code was predictable and you, and you knew what you were getting into. So it was the wrong reason entirely. And I would say version two perpetuated that. But again, we are expecting version three to really, you know, kind of pull itself back out of the mud and, and up to where it should be. Uh, one thing about site planning that's important that I want to mention, um, one of the core things, and as I mentioned when I started this, you know, from three units on up, you have to get a site plan under the current zoning. So, so once you add that ADU to a duplex, that's three units, and that would trigger a site plan requirement under the current code, and that is a year's worth of time and fifteen, twenty thousand dollars at a minimum. Uh, so, so we the part of the code is to eliminate site plan requirements from nine units or less. Um, the city is trying to do that. The departments uh, have all made a lot of asks. Ron will talk about that. Uh, in terms of the non-zoning sections of the code, they are, they are just as bad or worse as the zoning sections. Uh, and I want to be real clear about that. You think things are bad now, they're going to get worse under Code Next, and it's because we have to pay attention to the non-zoning sections of the code. All the departments are increasing their asks as a part of the process. Uh, so, 
site planning. They've gotten it to six units, but now they're getting some pushback from some other departments about, you know, Austin Water in particular, about trying to fit, uh, uh, you know, all those taps into their, their tight spaces, and they can't get their machine in there, so to speak. And, and we find that to be kind of a, a poor excuse not to have, you know, adequate housing citywide just because, you, you know, the water guys can't figure out a way to, to dig a hole. So uh, we'll keep pushing on that. Yes. So can you just kind of bullet point for us a few things that this council has done to make Austin more affordable? Um, recently, um, Delia Garza pulled the, the DSD budget from the master city budget, specifically over affordability concerns, uh, based on the fact that I think she tried to add an ADU and it realized it was so expensive just to add an ADU to her existing house. Uh, it cost 25 grand just to get a water tap installed for that ADU, for starters. Um, so, so, so recently we've had a lot more attention paid to why is it so expensive and I think part of that is our new 10-1 system kind of changed the, the politics a little bit so we now have a group of advocates that are very uh, strongly in favor of affordable housing and, uh, and so it's getting a lot more attention and in fact the HBA and RECA and so on we've all been meeting with with development services specifically to help them improve and that's something that also has not happened at least in my experience. Yeah, how much, uh, I read something that said that there was a concern about the number of maybe one bedroom ADUs that would be built. Is there, is there going to be regulation on density of one bedroom? Bedroom, bedroom counts currently are not regulated, um, and the parking requirements have changed. They have improved, so it's one space per unit under, under Code Next, whereas currently it's two spaces for a three-bedroom house or a two-bedroom house and so on. Uh, and we are very pr strong proponents of reducing the minimum parking requirements. Let the market decide what, what your parking is going to be. And that applies to large-scale buildings uh, as well as single-family homes. But in terms of bedroom counts, the concern that we have is family-friendly. If you generate, you know, thousands of one-bedroom units, that selects for, for singles, uh, you know, I I people who don't have families, essentially, you know. And, and that's part of the problem with the current system is we aren't building enough missing middle housing that is family-friendly. And, and that's a real problem. So... Um, that's certainly come up in discussions, and we want to make sure that, that there is adequate scope and flexibility, particularly in zonings like R4, you know, missing middle zonings that let you get multi-units instead of three teeny tiny units. You know, you know, that's not really serving the city's needs as well as it could. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ron Thrower. I have a land planning company. It's called Thrower Design, and uh, we do zoning subdivisions and site plans for properties anywhere from small single family all the way up to 350 acre developments. Uh, but I also have to point out right quick that I, my childhood home is only a half mile from here that I still own, and then um, Little League Baseball, that, where we played baseball, was just right up, right next to this building on the other side, and that's where I learned to play baseball. Um, so there's been a lot of change in my lifetime, for sure. Uh, so Code Next, it's coming, um, and uh, or so we thought, you know. And as Scott mentioned, it's uh, we got a, a, an announcement yesterday of another delay to this process, and you will find very few consultants uh, that that are like-minded like me that actually want a code to be simpler, kinder, gentler in every way, shape, and form, and cheaper to get done in the end. And so. That's what Code Next was supposed to start out as. It's supposed to be uh, simplifying the process. It's supposed to be able to be navigated by anybody. They were supposed to be able to pick up the code, read it, and understand what you can and can't do. And it's supposed to be less expensive and more affordable for the end users. And of course, we're not getting that. Uh, version 2 is still a very complex code, and we're still working through it. It's 1,388 pages long. It's got 58 different zones and 146 uh, separate uses. And inside that is 733 instances of conditional use permits and minor use permits, which is a heavily negotiated site plan that will go ultimately through a public hearing for an approval. And so, as Scott pointed out, um, Scott lives in the residential side of thing, and he does a great job with it. Scott's uh, actually also a client of mine, too, by the way. And uh, you would think that Scott and I would have coordinated this meeting a little bit better, but we didn't. Uh, Scott and I constantly are texting anywhere from 6 in the morning till 10 at night, but we didn't even talk about this meeting until two hours ago. <laughs> um, so anyway, there's major zones. You've got the residential house scale zone, the multifamily zones, and then you've got the mixed use zones, and then you've got the main street zones. And I'm going to concentrate on the main street zone today, and specifically the MS3A zone, because every one of these has a number and a letter nomenclature that goes with it, which adds to how many zones there actually is in the entire code. 
going through just the zoning section of the MS3A, the first page shows the building placement and it gets into the side articulations and that's how the building is going to lay out on the ground. Some of the articulations are very big. In other words, uh, the, one of the articulations is 24 feet by 24 feet and has to be every 60 feet on the side of a building. And that takes away from yield and it adds substantial amount of cost to every project. Uh, for multifamily projects, there's a requirement of courtyards along the side of a building, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, the next page, you get into the height, and that gets into the, more of the vertical articulations. Right now, the majority of the zones in Austin have a 60-foot height limit. This particular zone has a 75-foot height limit and allowing you to go up another 10 feet if you put in affordable housing. And then also on the rear side, there's going to be Compatibility, compatibility of setbacks or stepbacks in the building as it as it uh, lies up against the residential house scale zones. And then the next page gets into the encroachments about what you can and can't do inside of the setbacks, and it gets into the frontages about how much of your building has to be at the setback line along the street, and that's important from an urbanist perspective because we want the buildings pushed up towards the street to try and create a walkable environment along the street edge. And then you get into the parking about where can the parking go on a piece of property and that's even a complex uh, process to get to. Then on the fourth page you get into the impervious coverage. In this particular zone, 95% impervious coverage is what is allowed and it's impossible to achieve. Um, you get into open space requirements which is 5% of the gross site area of the property. Signage regulations and then you get into this additional, <coughs> additional requirements and that's where I'm going to concentrate a little bit on. Because you get into all these non-zoning requirements that, like Scott had mentioned, you get into buffers and landscape requirements and green stormwater infrastructure and new drainage requirements and transportation requirements. And so if you look at the buffers, there, there is now going to be a requirement that if you have an apartment project next door and you're putting in an apartment project, they want a landscape buffer in between. So that takes away yield that takes away uh, density for a property and it adds cost. And there's even different variations of types of buffers that have to go in. The landscaping requirements. The landscape requirements have increased significantly. The parking lot um, islands instances has increased. The sizes have increased. The parking lot um, medians have increased in, in between every parking module. And they're also going to be requiring a foundation buffer. So from your street edge, you have to put in a landscape buffer. And again, all these, all these grabs of land take away from density and yield on developments. And then drainage. One sentence in the drainage section of the code is causing a lot of concern with a lot of people. And that one sentence basically says that every project is going to have a large detention pond on the property or is going to be paying into a fund for the city infrastructure to get improved. And this is going to have a significant impact on yield if you're putting a large pond on your property or it's going to cost extra money for the developer, which then gets down into the end user. Transportation. Right now, the transportation code says that you don't trigger a traffic impact analysis until you reach a point of 2,000 vehicle trips. They're lowering that to 1,000 vehicle trips. So the trigger is going to be at a much lower scale but they're going to do this as an effort to try and get you out of your car with other measures. And that's called the, the demand management side of things. And that's, again, a much more complicated uh, code that's coming into play here. In the end, we have a 1,388 page code today, but there's more because there's going to be all these criteria manuals that are going to go along with it. I'm estimating there's probably going to be 5,000 pages of criteria manuals that haven't even been written yet that are going to have to dovetail into what the code says. So we've got, a, I think, a much more complicated code coming our direction, a more expensive code, and the end users are going to pay in this. And I'll uh, also say that we looked at a built project today on South Lamar, and it's uh, down there where Panther Trail is by the Ann Richards School. And that site is built today with 307 apartment units and about 3,000 square feet of commercial. And we looked at MS3A zoning on that property because that's how it's designated. In the end, because of all of these other asks, landscaping, transportation, detention, buffers, all that, 
in the end, we can only get to 215 units on that same piece of property. And that's after we added a floor to the building. It's built at five stories. We even made it six, and we could still only get to two thirds of where it's built today. And so we are working hard. I'm probably spending 20, 25 hours a week working on uh, Code Next. I know Scott is doing the same, and we have probably a dozen of us that are deeply entrenched and committed to try and make the code better in the end. And <clears throat> I'm hopeful that version three is going to be a better document. If it's not, I'm just going to quit and retire and <laughs> go to Canada or something. But um, that or I'm going to get rich. You know, that's, that's the alternatives because the prices of every site plan are go going to be two and three times what a site plan is today. And uh, that's not what I want. I want more good projects on the ground, and I want it to get, get done faster and cheaper. And I would rather permit 50 projects a year rather than 20. So with that, I'm available if you have any questions. Um, I left my business card up here, too, if you all um, want to take one. Yes, sir. Maybe I have a question. Um, from, I'm not sure exactly how to formulate the question. There's a lot of things that you said all seem to point towards changes in code next are going to drastically increase the cost per unit for commercial housing which seems counter to what city council says they want but you also said you might just quit because it's just getting so nasty that you know i just don't even want to mess with it anymore so extrapolating that forward as an investor in ccg what i'm interested in is is code next going to create a forced cooling of the Austin market? Is it going to force people to think, you know, I'd rather be building units in Waco. I think I'll go down to San Antonio. I think I'm going to pull up stakes and go do this elsewhere. I don't know if it's going to be a forced cooling. I think there might be some cooling. Uh, you know, right now, time will tell on this, but when they adopt Code Next, they're, they're talking about having a grace period where a uh, six month time frame where somebody could develop under the old code or under the new code. And I think personally during that time, we're gonna find a lot of people developing under the old code. Um, so I think that for a short period of time, we're gonna have a lot of projects that are still gonna get permitted. And I think people are still gonna to wanna to move here. But I also do think that yes, we're going to see outlying development uh, occurring, sprawl, which is you know not what we urbanists want to happen. And uh, I think that you're gonna see some of that go into the outlying areas of Austin and even out to the outlying cities. So then what your answer was, the code next net 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 seems to have two effects. One is uh, to raise the cost of what would have been more affordable housing, and number two is force all the construction farther out, put more load on the track on the transportation. Right. Yeah, it seems counterintuitive completely. I agree. Good job. <laughs> I'm sorry, I sit here and listen to that, and this sounds like a roadmap of the downward spiral of a litany across this country of urban areas that declined into nothing more than shells because nobody wants to live there, nobody can afford to live there, and nobody's going to come live there. I, you know? <laughs> that may be, you know, and, and I think that Austin is a little bit different type of market. I think. There's a lot of people that still want to come and move here. I'm drawing the analogy between true downtown urban areas right. and what's happening here in Austin, but we're not that big, you know. I agree. Yes. Are there any, any, other, any other cities that have been through this process that you have history on? You live their experience. Um, yes. Um, what's their status? Well, first of all, let me say that. Austin has spent eight and a half million dollars so far with the consultants getting this code to this point today. Um, City of Cedar Park rewrote their zoning code and in fact it got adopted uh, last week and they spent two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> writing their zoning code. So um, there are better ways to do it. Um, I do think that the consultant that Austin has hired is actually a very good consultant. If, if you were just to put that consultant in a room and leave them alone and let them do planning, I think that Austin could have a great code. But then you you uh, got to dovetail into that the, the policies and the politics and desires of council and, and all these other forces and that's what has got us to where we are. It could be much better. Yes, sir. 
What, in your opinion, is the main political or policy driver of that complication in India? Well, I'm glad you said it because that's the first thing that popped in my mind. I wanted to say it, but uh, um, I do think a lot of it is that um, you know it's just change in general. You know, Austin doesn't seem to like change. They don't accept change, even at the council level. You know, there's there's constant pushback on change on anything. Thank y'all. I appreciate it. Um, again, if y'all have any questions, feel free to email us. Okay, I, I think everybody, you know, really enjoyed uh, Ron and Scott. I saw, I mean, more interaction, I think, you know, from the group to them than I've seen in a long time. Uh, yeah, I, you said that, not me. Dr. Perkins says we're getting, you're getting smarter, so I didn't say it. But I think, you know, it's really important, uh, no matter what side of the aisle you're on or there is even an aisle that, but this is really could change, you know, really going to change the our city for years and years to come. Um, you know, I see it as far as uh, you know in the construction, but also you know uh, as a resident and also as a lender here. You know, I think that you know as Ron said, we'll still have people moving to Austin. You still have job growth here. We still have a very very low inventory across the board. Uh, on everything, really, all classes of, of, of real estate. So, um, you know, and then there'll be people that, you know, will be innovators coming out of this too when the, when the code next becomes, you know, final. Um, so I really appreciate them coming, uh, taking time out of their schedule. I think everybody enjoyed it. I just give them a round of applause. Thank you. So state of the funds. 2017 is kind of you know where we where we're at right now after the third quarter, um, and uh, you know kind of give an overview of of the um, of the two funds. I'll give an overview of two funds, basically the legal structure of them, uh, management company, and then we'll dive into some charts and graphs and. Things of that nature. So some of this may be rehashed for, for you, but uh, I'll just hit the high points. So Capital Group, which is a management company, we were established in 2008 as Pride of Austin Capital Partners, as many of you know. Um, we're an LLC in Texas. We manage two Reg D securities. Uh, there's no performance bonus. Uh, managing members myself. Um, we have an advisory board. and. The members are investors in both in uh, both funds. Uh, there originally were five members of this management company. Um, without rehashing the story, there was dealt we're down to four, and those are the four still. So, four out of the original five are still in it today, almost ten years later. Quick snapshot of kind of where we're at in the in the, in our with our two funds. Of course, we're in Austin, uh, North Carolina. As many of you know, we're in the Raleigh-Durham, that research triangle, which is a very strong market, also in Charlotte area. Uh, we've, we've been in those, those two markets now almost three years. Uh, we have one, uh, one loan out in Roseville, California, by the Galleria in Sacramento. It's a, a commercial place out there, the Falls Event Center is the bar. And uh, we're looking at being paid off from them in, in about the next four to six months. So, um, and I won't be, we won't be going back to California anytime soon. Not to say this isn't a good bar. We just, you know, we did a loan here in, Ta in Austin and Cedar Park with them. Thus, this is where we, we came away with this one as well. <clears throat> not actively. No, not actively. I'm not sending a mean to California or, or North Dakota. <laughs> North Dakota. <laughs> not Wyoming either. Alternative investing. Why is an investor is alternative investing? You get passive income. You know, investor is not responsible for due diligence. You know, Jim. I'll use Jim as an example. Jim, you know, had commercial real estate, started selling it off, got tired of being the landlord, so to speak. I think he kept some of his bread and butter, but then started investing in in with us and other people, as uh, I assume as well. And you know, he gets mailbox money. He doesn't have to do all the due diligence. He doesn't have to service the loan. He doesn't have to, you know, track down his, his uh, tenants. 
all that stuff. So you get mailbox money, direct deposit. You know, we, we've been doing, I think we've been doing a pretty good job on our ACH transactions and, and rolling that out. Um, so money in your, you wake up the next morning or two days later and there's your, there's your money after we announce, obviously. Uh, be the bank. You know, we, you, you are the bank. We are the bank. We're a private bank, essentially. Uh, tangible asset, you know, where you invest in the stock market or mutual funds. You have a piece of paper, even, even, if you even have a piece of paper. Uh, this tangible asset, you have something tangible. You know, you can go, we have something to take back if we have to. Private lending, why is private lending, you know, around? Um, I, Ellen could probably come up and talk a little bit about this. Um, you know, conventional banks are not lending to developers, to um, you know, fix and flippers. Um, they're just, they're not lending. They're still not lending with at the rate they were lending prior to the mortgage crash in 2008. So there's still a need for private lending out there, um, and it's growing. It's asset-based lending versus credit-based lending. So we're truly looking at the asset. We are looking at the at the bar, and then you know their their credit score does have a little bit of a play in it. Um, if somebody has a 400 credit score, we're not going to be their lender. Um, but we're really about the asset. We're about the the contractor as well, um, the exit strategy. Uh, so it's all based upon the asset. Uh, flexibility. So as a private lender, we're flexible. We don't have a a, uh, a bank, um, uh, a loan committee that sits around a table in suits and ties that don't that really don't understand development. We're we're flexible. We you know we can we're local. I think that really plays a lot. Faster underwriting. It's up to the bar to get us the information, but once we get it, we can move at a at a faster faster rate than a traditional bank. Underwriting. So I. Many of you may know, may not know, uh, that I, I teach a class out at the private lending and I teach a, a, on underwriting and servicing. So underwriting, you know, we, I say this, this is my first line all, always, guard our lending parameters. So we set our lending parameters. Our lending parameters are defined in our PPM. We set that bar. We don't raise and lower that bar depending upon a loan request that comes in. Either they, a means of first filter, either it, Passes, passes that, gets over the bar. If it doesn't, we let the potential bar know why it did it. So they can maybe adjust on their end. Maybe it's more capital, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. <coughs> but we guard our lending parameters. And I think that's what's made us successful. Uh, if I point back at a you know, couple of things, I would say that that is very successful because it it's simple, stupid. We, we, set our, we set our bar and that's where it is. And people, people know that, they respect that. Um, you know, underwriting, we're looking at the asset, we're looking at the bar financial stability, exit strategy, and contractors. All, of, all four of these are, you know, right across the board on the same plane. Now, I wouldn't say one is greater than the other. Contractor is, you know, equally as important as an exit strategy, as it is the bar's uh, financial uh, ability to service the loan. And of course, the asset, and we, I mean, we start there. If, that, if, it, if there's anything, the asset would be probably a little higher. Uh, consistency. Going back to guard our lending parameters, we're consistent in our, in our structure. We don't, we're not changing it up. Um, we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, we never put out money just to make a loan. I would rather give money back to investors if there comes a time where we have too much capital than make a loan, make a bad loan, which would, you know, because we're not guarding our lending parameters. Consider investors first. I mean, like I said, management company, all the members in there are uh, investors. So, you know, we're considering investors first. We are, we're not going to make a loan just to make a loan. Servicing. So we service our loans in-house, and I think that really is another uh, uh, area where we've been able to be successful because we're not... Uh, we don't have a third-party servicer in Iowa or California. Uh, we do our own inspections. Uh, we require down dates on the title when it's a construction loan. As the, as the uh, loan amount gets higher, we have the bar give us a down date, making sure there's no new liens popping up. If there's a, a blimp, uh, 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 um, you know, say a, a, we're scared of a bubble maybe coming in a certain market, we can always ask for a value check having that uh, appraiser go in 
and give us an up-to-date value. Communication, I think, is the biggest thing, is we're always in communication with our bars, you know, almost on a weekly basis. Loan exit. I mean, we can make a loan, but it's equally as important to get, a, to get the money back so we can make more loans, right? So, you know, loan exit, you got payoff, which is what we want. Extension, we generate some more income for the funds. Uh, we push that uh, maturity date out a little bit. Only if they're in good standing, or only if there's no liens, the, you know, the bar is in good standing. They're not in default. Uh, a workout scenario, now you're getting into where they may not be in default. They may be, you know, on the verge of being in default. There may be, you know, where they haven't paid their interest. We may have to cut some interest back uh, to get our payout. Uh, so, we're, you know, we're foreclosure. Obviously, we want to protect our asset. That's our collateral. So, you know, if they're not, if we can't get exit the loan, then we're going to foreclose. Um, then liquidate. Always liquidate is our, is our strategy if we foreclose. The opportunity fund, now we're getting into the, uh, the different funds. So opportunity fund, the legal, it's a Reg D securities filed in all 50 states, organized as an LLC here in Texas. Investors are members, 100% owned by investors. It was established uh, a little over three years ago. Um, it runs through 2034. Uh, Ten-year extension uh, up to 2044, and majority of the members may extend beyond that. It's accredited investors only, fifty thousand dollar minimum. It's a two-year lockup period, semi-annual distributions. So it's June 30th and December 31st, and I think that's a repeat. So um, I just will make sure you know it's owned by investors. Um, so the couple differences here that I highlighted here with the opportunity fund versus the high yield fund. Second liens are permitted provided the first lien is held by the high yield fund. So we're not going to do a second lien if Wells Fargo is the first lien. We lose control of that. Then if something happens if the first lien uh, holder uh, uh, wants, to, wants to foreclose, then to protect our lien we would have to buy out the first lien. So. That puts us in a, in a position we don't want to be in. So we were only going to do a second lien if the high yield fund is in position is in first lien. Uh, that way we are in control. It's up to a five year term with extensions possible of first liens held by the opportunity fund. So this this one was it can go up to up to five years. Uh, we haven't done a five year. We've done only done a max of three years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it does allow up to five years, whereas the high yield fund is, is more short term, uh, a year to 18 months. This was as of June 30th, the semi-annual, as you can see. Um, it has more peaks and valleys than you'll see in the high yield fund. Uh, the reason that is we allow the interest to accrue. So we're all, and we're a cash basis accounting. So we only allow, we only recognize a dollar when we earn, when we earn that dollar, when we receive that dollar. So. You'll, that's why you see these peaks and valleys there. So we receive we receive interest if there's an extension, we collect some interest then. And we also collect the interest obviously if there's a pay a payoff. We also generate income when we originate a loan. And at June 30th, this is what our breakdown nine and a half million. Moving into the high yield fund. So again, it's a Reg D security filed in all 50 states. It's organized in, as an LLC here in Texas. Um, investors are members, and it's 100% owned by the investors. It was established in, in 2008, so we're coming up at the end of our ninth year. Um, its uh, filing expires in 2028, and another 10-year extension is, al is allowed by the manager. And of course, the majority of the members can extend beyond that. Same, same. Uh, Parameters uh, are same yep, as the high, uh, opportunity fund. So here are the terms on the high yield, uh, high yield fund. So nine to eighteen months is the terms. You know, up to two, three, or six month extensions possible. We have gone up to nine month extension um, in uh, in the past, but only one of those. So it's kind of max of seventy percent LTV. Let's loan to value after repaired value. So. You know, if we're a construction lender, we're given a value on what's to be built. The appraiser's valuing that at some six month in the future, nine month in the future. That's why it's important we can have value checks because 
as the, as this asset is is being built, if if we're seeing signs in the in the market where we're might be starting to question that value that was given, we have the ability to require an, an updated appraiser appraisal, and that way, if it if our LTV say the loan was at 70 percent and now the loan is at 72 percent, our loan docs allow us to request that the the bar pay down or they're in default. Uh, interest range is 11 to 13 percent and uh, three lender discount points to the fund. Here's a chart over the last three years. Um, so you see it, you know, pretty much anywhere from 10 and a quarter to what, uh, almost 12 percent, you know, uh, over the last three years. You'll see in the Januaries that they're a little lower. That's because we have our we're, we're cash basis accounting again, so we have our our um, our um, compliance that we have to do each year. We have our accounting, uh, our tax accountant we have to do. So we have all these expenses at the beginning of the year that we do not accrue, and we pay then. So that's why it's a little a lower there. Here's the breakdown. I just sent this out, but uh, here it is. Uh, so as of September 30th, we're at 68 million assets under management. Um, you know, we got a big slice of the pie on residential construction, which is, you know, across our markets. Uh, Non-performing, zero. REO went down. We sold the hotel in Stanton. So, so I was really excited about that, to be honest. I mean, I'm really excited. Uh, I, I didn't lose much sleep over that one, but I was I was nervous. And uh, you know, we had an, an operator out of uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, last name Patel, and they had I think I mean what 17, 18 hotels in their portfolio, and um, they kicked the tires and they bought our hotel and the Candlewood Suites, I believe, that was like half a block or half a mile away. They bought both of those at the same time. So they have one side of the road, one side of I-20 or I-10, whatever it is, I-20, and the other side of I-20. So really excited about that. And, and of course, we haven't added any non-performing. We haven't added any REOs. So what's, we still have those two uh, Fulcher uh, buildings, which I'll get to. I'll give you an update on that in a minute. Um, reserve account. So we always have a reserve account, a rainy day fund. We're a little shy of $2 million there. Um, Sorry, um, commercial income producing about five. I think it's five, five, almost six million. Commercial construction a little over ten million, and as you see, commercial development seven, and then some cash on hand. So, and we just this was uh, this was at June thirtieth, so we had some cash. We had a little bit of cash on hand. We had some loans pay off, I believe, for the third quarter. We had. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we had about uh, five, five and a half million dollars in loans originated. We had, uh, uh, not including the hotel, we had about four, uh, we had uh, six and a half million dollars that we, sorry, I reversed, I reversed that. We had six and a half million that we originated, and we had four and a half million that paid off, not including the hotel. And the hotel was re reflected that income in the last. Uh, second quarter. Yes. No, it was the third quarter. It was the third quarter. Sorry. I'm sorry. But I didn't, there wasn't a loan payoff or a loan origination, so I it did, you know. It was an REO. So, yeah. The, what is the commercial income producing? Commercial income producing, that that would be, um, that is the, um, the, the Falls Event Center uh, that's in Roseville, California. Uh, and... What else is there? There's something else I'm blanking right now, um, but I can. Because that's not the income coming off the full shirt. No, no, because it's an REO. It's an REO, right? There's another. There's another loan that's. I'm not. You put me on the spotlight. Yeah, but no, it's the REO is is an REO. It's not not double dip there. No, that's they're operating. They've been they've been operating for about six seven months now. Right. What kind of um, income returns are we getting off of the income producer? Uh, 
Well, that's, it's just, it's, what, it's an operating, so we're not re really receiving the income. I'm just, I'm labeling it that it's not a, it's not a construction loan. It's more of a bridge loan or um, semi-perm loan. So we're not, we're not funding a construction. So it's, it may be a strip, strip center where you have a, a landlord that's receiving money. Yeah. Are they, um, are they servicing? We service, we service them. I mean, are they, are, are they paying their debt for <coughs> Well, yeah, no, it's, it's interest only. Okay. All our loans, all our loans are interest only. But they are, they are current. Yes, yes, we have, yeah, because if it was, if it was not, if it was, if they weren't current, then we move them up to non-performing. So this was this hotel in Stanton that we talked about. I left it in here just so I could talk about it, but anyway, to let you know we sold it. Um, so anyway, we, it's gone. Uh, no, we didn't make any money. Uh, we, you know, to be, we didn't. We had some interest that was sitting there that we don't accrue interest, but it was, it was sitting there and, we, and we, we weren't able to realize that interest. So we got our capital back and maybe 15, 17,000, I think. So we made a tiny bit, um, but when you, you know, closing costs ate quite a bit of that up. So uh, the high yield fund, we have the two REO properties down in Fulcher. Uh, we just signed a, uh, a substantial lease um, a while back. We had Lowe's was in there. They were doing a hiring center in there. Now HEB has basically taken over their spot and increased it. They're doing a hiring center because they're building a new HEB in Fulcher. So we have multiple tenants in, in, uh, in building one. We're receiving income on that. Uh, so this really needs to be updated. Lowe's hiring center. Um, is now an HEB hiring center. Um, I apologize. Let me let me stop here. I apologize that this I had to do my own PowerPoint, and, and I'm not very good at doing this. Tibet uh, and Ryan Stewart, they uh, they had their second. They had a little girl uh, back uh, about three weeks ago, so she's out. Uh, so now they have a uh, second daughter. Feel sorry for Ryan, but uh, anyway. Um, so anyway, I just you know everybody's doing well there, and and so that's why you know I'm having a little. Just be honest with you about my PowerPoint here. <laughs> so. Um, Are you trying to explain away the typos, right? Exactly. <laughs> They're not numbers. There's no typos. Uh, so HEB has a hiring center there. Uh, building two uh, is the you know if you remember is the shell. We didn't finish it. Um, the church was uh, had it under contract. They could not get the adequate parking that the city required, so they dropped off. So uh, we're still, you know, we still have it. Um, we're trying. We're still working with planning and zoning to replat to subdivide. Um, and it's kind of like Austin, not really going much anywhere. It's 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 a small town and politics. Uh, it's managed and marketed by Central Management. Trent Vosick. Is uh, is our broker down there? What kind of income do those? Draw? We we get we receive probably about four or five percent. It's triple net leases. And building two is totally vacant. Totally vacant. So as a whole, we're getting about four about four percent, I would say. In that area, Rob. Well, Jim was down there. And he seemed to indicate there's like growth. I mean, like, yeah, there's it growth looks, down there. It looks like value could actually increase. Yes, there could be. It just it's it's been a little slow, I think. You know, right. with the with the energy. You know, it's still outside of Houston and and how I, far out not, is the road? Sorry. How far out is? I think it's 40, 50 miles. About 40. 40, yeah, something the like that. Center of downtown. Center of downtown. Yeah. To the west or? Yeah. Yes, due west on I-10. Yes, it's right before Katie. You've heard of it too. Though. You only have to go about a half mile to a mile at the most to where you hit dense population. Oh yeah, there's dense population now. And then of course the you know Harvey, there was there they had some major flooding down in Fulcher too. Luckily we had no issues. We had a, we had like four thousand dollars worth of damage in, to both buildings. So you know that was good, very good. Um, so yeah, I, I'm. You know, I'm optimistic eventually, you know, it's going to come around us because it's down the road, like you said, Jim, you know, the, the growth. And HEB's building a new center there. It's not like they didn't have one there. 
Because uh, somebody had. Oops. Uh, yes, sorry. Yes. For all the real estate out there, we do maintain insurance. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Definitely. Yes. Yes. We maintain insurance on anything REO. Of course, you know. Uh, and let me just go off of that. You know, our bars we require obviously insurance that on all the properties. Uh, builders risk. So as they're adding value, they're going up. Builders risk is you know in case uh, act of mother nature, fire, whatever it may be. If it destroys what's going up, you know that that insurance is policy is there to put it back in place. When it becomes owned by us. Oh yes. Oh yes. Right away. Right away. Put on my risk manager hat. Oh definitely. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Uh, investor portal <laughs> initiative. I, I, now this this was not updated from last lunch and learn. So we've we've made great great strides in this, um, and uh, Jacob has uh, spearheaded this for us with his with his company and done a gr fabulous job. I really appreciate all the hard work he's put in. So we're we're now at the stage where we uh, at the office the team we're 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 just trying to make it break, and we can't make it break. So that's a good sign. You know, we're trying to we do, I guess, a shakedown, basically. Like a race car, you take it out on the track and you shake it down and see what falls out of it. And nothing's falling out of it. So that's good. So now the goal for us now is to have your, your fourth quarter, you know, at the beginning of the year, have, your four, you know, have this thing live. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll be updating you how this is going to roll out and, you know, what's your role in uh, as an investor. You know, it's just going to be a very scaled down version of you going to Wells Fargo or whatever and logging in and seeing your statements there. Be, you know, hopefully very simple, um, very easy to navigate, I feel like. Um, so you'll be looking, looking for this over the next month, uh, month to two months as we roll this out and, and send out your uh, information, how to log in and all that stuff. And you know, coming up, just accounting reminders coming up, you know, it's, it's already November. Uh, you know, you're, if you're an IRA, self-directed, you'll have uh, valuations. I did update this, Mr. Dr. Perkins. So, 2017, I caught that. See, the numbers I could catch. <laughs> so, valuation for 2017, if you have a self-directed IRA with an, uh, you know, a number of custodians out there, they'll send you a form. Please get it to us so we can... Uh, you know, take care of it for you and send it back to you and your custodian. Uh, and then K-1s, you know, as an investor, you receive a K-1 and March 15th would get those out to you uh, so you can have a month to file your taxes. Is that a hard commit date? That is a hard commit date. It will be. <laughs> this is not, not an exception for us. <laughs> Sometimes my hands are tied with you. So, I know that was fast, but uh, you know, kind of want to get through it because we, you know, I think we all really enjoyed what Scott and Ron had to say. So I'll open up if anybody has any questions. Um, kind of one, yes, sir. Very simplistic. Should I wish to move some of my funds from the high yield fund over to the other fund? Mm -hmm. you know, not a problem doing that. Not a problem at all. Yes, sir. Well, too. That one on the inside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. John. Yeah. Well, first off, congratulations. I mean, the, the interest rates, the returns have been very consistent. And, Thank you. You know, exactly at least why I got in the fund. And so, congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm curious. Are there institutional people coming into doing that, filling this void? Is there competition? What, what, what we're seeing is, and it's, it's, and I, I get, we get calls probably a couple times a week. You'll have these institutions that have little satellites that break off, and they'll they'll contact us and they'll want to buy our loans. And where where you know where, that's not the business that's not our business model uh, one is they're not going to take something that is not fully funded well most of ours are not because it's construction and if they are you know there's only a short gap there before we get paid off so it's really more you, you're seeing more I've seen more of that 
Um, Ellen, do you? I mean, you, you're you're in it quite a bit. Do you do you see any more institutionals? Actually, out there? I don't. And um, I mean, I don't. Um, but banks are actually my best referral sources. I mean, mm -hmm. all of my business comes from big banks. Um, that aren't you know funding loans for their own customers. Right. And so they call people like me because obviously we don't have a requirement of where the depository relationship is. Right. So the deposits stay with the bank, but yet we can come in and actually do the construction loans and then you know, convert it to permanent financing if that's necessary or they pay off in full. Right. So just a background, Ellen, Ellen uh, is, a, is, a, is a broker, uh, probably the only broker I've worked with in the last couple of years, uh, which is says a lot. Uh, uh, about her and her business and her ethics, uh, really respect her, and she became a, an investor, I guess, two year two years ago, and so that's why I ask her because she's she's at the front end of things and see, would see more, you know, what's going on. Because I, I, I now that you said that, I remember there was a few deals you brought to us that the bank called you up. Yeah, that's my only referral source. I don't, I don't market, I don't advertise. I, I barely even carry business cards with me. Um, <laughs> that's a nice so, way of coming. Yeah, yeah, so I just I work with the banks, and that way I get um, a good background information on the customer before I even talk to them. Because they've done a lot of research. They know them. They have the yeah. deposits. They. Yeah. What, what I, what the biggest struggle I have, Robert, the whole thing is that it seems like with money being so cheap, I mean, you're you're zero or less. And people are willing to pay this amount on, you know, getting a loan. It's just hard to fathom. Well, it's either they, they pay it to get it or they don't get it. Yeah, banks are not going to loan the money. Especially if it's new construction, banks don't want to touch it no matter how solid you think the deal is. Um, for new construction, to build like a, construction, the banks a planet fitness, fitness, to do no, any of that kind no, of stuff. No. No. You know, Isn't that, that crazy? That's, that is crazy when you think about it, but that's why we're in the market. Yeah, no, I, I can see that, Robert. It's just yeah. it's hard to fathom because that's not the way I was raised. At a bank, you went to oh, yeah. an institution, well, yeah. exactly. they took care of you, they just took care of you. You've been on their rock. Got their rock. Got their rock. Got their rock. Got their rock. <laughs> Frank Dodd, yeah, Frank Dodd is really. So is that what did it? Frank Dodd, yes. Because yeah. they had, they, uh, it's two to three so times they have to have in deposits versus what they loan out. <laughs> it's our friend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's in a very oblique way. It's great. Yeah. And then also, I mean, I, you know, you have, you have, not only the banks are lending, so then you get into where you have, you have uh, equity positions. Well, as, an, as a bar, it's, you lose control. If you bring in an equity person, then you're losing control of it. Basically, you're selling off 20%. Yeah, you lose equity. So you're, you've got another uh, you know, uh, person, basically, in the room making the decisions with you. We're not, you know, we're a lender. We have to have our lender hat on. We're not going to make decisions for you unless you get, are in default. Then that's when we'll start making decisions for you. But we're going to let you, because we un, we did our underwriting, our background on you. We're going to let you do what you do. You're a builder. You're a developer. So you have control over your project. And so when you look at maybe selling off 20%, look at us, 11 and 3, that's 14. They get control, plus they save 6%. If there's a broker involved, you know, they save you know, 4% and they have full control over their project. Wow. Ray. Um, two things, can you uh, talk to us a little bit about loan demand? Is it still good? And then growth of the funds year over year? Uh, loan demand is still, is still, uh, still out there. Uh, it's, we've, we've gotten a rash, I would say, in the last month of just, you know, I would say, like in better terms, kind of some trash loans, bottom feeders and stuff. But we do have, you know, we had some, we have some, we had a good one that Ellen brought brought forward to us. We think she's still working on the guy a little bit. Um, you know, some some of them out there paying a little hard hard ball. Uh, we've got one that's uh, we just got this week uh, down in uh, uh, Kyle Buta area uh, for 54 lots down there. So you know, uh, we're still seeing activity. Um, I'd say there was an in a little increase in activity of loan requests, but not n the jump, you know, the, the quality of them, I think it's still about the same, right? Um, year over year, you know, the last couple of years, we pretty much have been just a slight maybe growth or flat line, you know, as a fund, as, a, as total funds together. Um, just because I think, you, you know, we're at this point now, we're nine, ten years in, and, you know, life happens. We've had people... That, you know, have passed away, and we've had people that have, you know, life-changing events. 
Uh, they've you know, pulled out, moved to Saudi Arabia, whatever. I've had people, you know, so all kinds, but then I've also had new investors come in. So I think we're, you know, we've been floating, you know, we were, I think we've had an uptick, you know, over the last probably two years, we've gone up in the high yield fund probably five, six million dollars, you know, from like 32 to 38 now. Um, so, but not, not like, not like we experienced back in say 12 to 14, where we had a pretty good increase there. But uh, but it's comfortable. I, this is where I think you know, as a, as a as the, the managing member, I think the team that is in place, you know, this is our comf this is really our good comfort level here. You know, you're not going to expect us to jump up to 50 million. That's not. I don't see that as our comfort level. I think you know, we get to 40, and you know, we'll. I think we're 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 at our comfort level here. Justin. So, kind of the looking forward. I mean, is 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 a kind of a five-year plan of hey, looking for some more diversification outside of Austin, or kind of you know with the code next in limbo, as, or is it hey, we're doubling down here? Uh, what's kind of the I guess the strategy, and also throwing in the mix, you know, Harvey and Houston. Is there yeah. any appetite to get involved? In the yeah. uh, you know, I I mean we're Texas based, so we're all in on Texas. Obviously, uh, we you know we're North Carolina was just a you know was a was a, a right fit. I had a biz, I had a relationship with two guys out there, their principals in the in a company, and I've known them for eight years, and they've been a bar now for three. So we didn't we kind of you know we didn't I didn't send a mean out there to go <laughs> knock on doors. We kind of. Uh, you know, it was a, just a right fit. Um, so we've always, you know, Austin, you know, Code Next is a little, uh, you know, it's a little scary. What's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen, I guess. So we, we may know a little bit more now. Um, but Austin's growing. I mean, you got, you got people moving here and you got jobs moving here. So there's, there's a need for it. So, you know, it's going to be some changing here, you know, and, and, you know, if somebody's bringing me something that they're going to, they're going to be able to permit, you know, I need a site plan that's going to be, you know, a year from now, which we wouldn't do this loan anyway. This is just an example. I, I wouldn't do a loan because you don't know what that's going to be like in a year. What they're bringing me on paper may not be able to be built, right? So, so unless it's something, you know, single family, a duplex, something that I know can get into permitting, get out of permitting within the next four or five months, you know, not looking for something down the road like that. Houston, you know, we were in Houston, uh, when did we get out of Houston? We got out, when was the mar oil market? Into 14? Into 14. So at the end of 14, we were probably 15 loans deep into, into Houston um, and, um, you know, rocking and rolling down there. And then you started the summer of 14, started seeing oil kind of. And I told him, me and Dennis, we're not doing any more loan, taking any more loan requests for Houston. And, uh, you know, we, the guy, the bar that we had, um, I think we had one or two bars, but anyway, they, they worked through. We got paid off. No, no defaults. Nothing. They they really worked hard. Uh, Matt Solomon and his guys. Um, but we haven't been back. But that was because of the energy, you know. And now you got Harvey. But you see, me could probably speak a little more on this. You see, you know, I was talking about some trashy loan requests we got. Uh, it's coming out of Houston. You get some, you know, the water rises, snakes start going. <laughs> you know, so you got to be. We're really. We're, I mean, it's true, right? I mean, right, Jim? I mean, it's so you got, you know, we're why I'd like to get back in there, you know, I'd see oil ticking up a little bit, but you got to really be careful in these rehab markets like that, especially when you had total destruction. So, yes, sir. Question, what's your opinion of the impact of the potential repeal of Dodd Frank? Uh, I don't, I haven't really studied that, to be honest with you. So, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, I, I mean, we are in a, you know, in an environment where regulations are being cut. Um, Does so, that affect the bank's uh, ability or desire to get into this market? It could. It could. I mean, it, you know, if they, if their if their requirement now is two or three times, you know, if they so every every dollar that they loan, they have to have three dollars to back it up. So if that goes down to one to one. I mean, yeah, I would, you know, say say the so, but I think you got to, you know, I think may, interest rates may creep up a little bit. I don't know, you know, it's, I, I, I don't know where we're going to go with that, to be honest with you. Um, I can tell you this, that before Dodd-Frank, private lenders existed, and they were at a higher rate. I mean, when we first got in, 
we were we were at it, we would we were lending them 18 percent, which is the limit in Texas. Then you had some California money move in, so we had to drop our rates down a little bit. But that was really before even Dodd Frank really became you know what it is today. So I think you know we'll have to just kind of adapt, see where our niche is if that happens, and where we where we go. You know. That would certainly give banks more ability yep. to get into our space, but I have a hard time believing that it would give them the desire to want to do the underwriting. I, I agree with you, and also there you got to think they're still credit-based lenders, yep. so you have developers that are putting, you know, tying up their credit. So if they have their mortgage and they have this and that. How are they going to qualify for this? You know, they're not. They're not. You're not. A, a, a conventional bank's not going to do a 54 lot subdivision. You know, it's all. It's equity. It may be a little bank loan, but it's it's minor. You know, it's all equity in tiers, waterfalls, and things like that. So they don't want yeah. this risk. Space. No, they don't want this risk because once they once they get it back, they know they they remember what happened when they had to get it, when they had to take all this back before. You know, I, when I was when me and I went to the conference uh, this past weekend in Vegas for private lending. What what movie did I watch? The Big Short again. <laughs> of course, I watched it. <laughs> so you know, I mean, those you know, water. The guy, you know, I think waters are. Anyway, I can't even remember that far back. How, how high were the rates on the banks would lend money on construction development back in the day? Or how much higher than normal? I don't know. I, I can't even remember, too. No. Anybody remember? No. We paid 21. Just the 20, 21? 21? Wow. Wow. <laughs> even if the executive branch issued an executive order and did away with God's right today, you got to remember. An institution the size of U.S. banking, when I say institution, I don't mean be laid out on your own corn, right? I'm talking about that is an industry an institution. It takes them three to five years to react and implement that change. Look how long it took to implement when they put it in effect. Mm -hmm. yeah, they still haven't right. it all in place. You you know? Know? You're right. They still haven't rolled out the all of Dodd Frank that they initially set up. Yeah, this is yeah, you know, it's not something that's going to. Oh, Miss Susan. Since uh, 2016, 2017, we've only had small incremental increases in the interest rate. What what point would you anticipate that interest rate increases, say within the next five years, might be affecting your business? I don't really think it will affect our business. I think you know all of this kind of with the Dodd Frank and you know and if it goes away, I, I still when you look back at it. What makes us attractive is we're asset-based lenders. When you look at, when you boil that down, you know, whether the bank, now it, yeah, it could have an effect on the exit. So if you have, you know, somebody going in and building a, a subdivision, you know, obviously, you know, interest creeps up on home buyers. That could, that, that could play a, you know, play a role in that. But, you know, you, when you talk little bitty increments that we've had, you know, I don't think it's really, I haven't seen it affect us really. You know, and even the talk of it's not scaring the, these markets that we're in. You still see them flying off the shelf. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Everybody's asking the same question from different angles. That's fine. Uh, first, let me just say uh, congratulations, obviously, are, are, are due, but on the hotel, uh, yes, sir. special congratulations because, I mean, that, that's, that's the the model that attracted us here was the safety because you've got that asset and you just actually pulled it off as a poster child for Thank the you. fact that, that that asset protection actually exists. So congratulations on that. My question is, I mean, everybody's thrown at you, what about this, what about this? Okay, I'm just going to turn it around and say, what do you worry about? What's What do you watch out there as, a, as an indicator that makes you think this way? <laughs> well, you have my table. That's fine. <laughs> no, what I do worry about is 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 when I look at it, you know supply demand. So we got you know in these markets, you have job growth, you have you know job unemployment rates. Where are they at? What is the the inventory at on exit you know home homes out there or commercial space? Whatever the whatever the classification is, you know is there high 
occupancy in commercial space? Is it low? We're just really looking at supply demand across the, across the board and seeing where we are. And if there's, you know, if we have an inventory of nine months here in Austin, well, I'm not going to go make a, a loan on a single family house that's good. The exit strategy is going to be to sell it. You got nine months sitting out there. But here we've got two, less, little less than three, or right at three months of inventory. In a, in a, a steady, you know, uh, an equilibrium type um, uh, market, it's six to seven months here in Austin. So and then you look at unemployment rate. I mean, it's almost scary low. Because when you get too low, the, the job force isn't out there to hire adequate employees. So I just go back to my economics at my, my community college and, you know, supply demand, really, to be honest with you. And none of those worry you right now? Not, right, not, right, not in these markets that we're in, no, because it's all it all shows that low inventory, high demand, low supply, high demand. And I think that's why you continue to see price increases, you know, in, in Austin. They, now, they've kind of flattened out a little bit. This last thing I got from uh, Austin Tidal um, it was, you know, it was kind of a, the prices did have flattened. But the inventory is still low. Uh, actually, pendings are up. Sold is, are up year over year. Uh, same when, uh, in, in, the, in the markets in North Carolina. So I, I, that's where I really study, you know, study hard at is those, those type graphs and charts. Jim? There's a lot of numbers that get generated at the Austin Home Builders Association. Yep. Rob went to it, I went to it, and I thought it was going to look like it was flat. And this, what, about two months ago, they had their annual meetings. Yes, yeah. And they, they still say demand is, is outweighing the supply mm -hmm. in Austin area. Still deliverable lots. They're yeah. still so concerned about, the, you know, a developer, excuse me, building, uh, delivering buildable lots, a subdivision, basically. There's still a huge concern about that because the big ones that you have out there are almost completely built, you know, built out. Terra Vista and you know all these up on the northern part. Really, the hot bed, you know, and I think, you know, us, uh, you know, with this new loan request we got down there in Butte, Kyle, that is the, that's going to be the next big growth is right there. They got water down there. They got obviously land down there. That's going to be where. You know, it's where you're going to see these AV ranches are going to be down that way and those things. Hey, Robert, is there any way to catch what you're doing in that second fund that you had so it's more dividend producing rather than interest producing? The returns, so that they are dividend as being paid as an interest. Interest becomes regular income. It is. It is. It is. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, it's. it's I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not following well, your question. There's two, two components when you're taxed. It's interest, and it's usually at regular income. Right. And dividend income is limited depending on the amount of money that you make. It be as little as you know, less than 15% of, you know, that you pay taxes on. Okay. So something that is paid out of a mutual fund it's generally a dividend. Right. As opposed to an interest the, payment. The, this is interest. This way it's set up is interest. And the question is, can it be done in any other way? No, sir. Not that I'm aware of. No. 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 Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're an owner, you're a member, you're, you're getting the interest that's generated. That's because you can't convert the interest you're getting to dividends to pay out to a debt. Exactly, yeah. You're a little smaller than me. <laughs> Any more questions? If if not, I really appreciate everybody coming, and uh, I appreciate the uh, the support as always. And and uh, you know we'll keep trucking along. All right. Have a have a good Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you.